Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, this is Archbishop Perez with a special message recognizing the incredible work of the St. Raymond Nonatus Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. In 2015, its founders were inspired by the World Meeting of Families and the visit of Pope Francis to create a pastoral ministry in Philadelphia for the benefit of families facing relationship crisis. The foundation ministers to struggling families and individuals through a confidential prayer line, pastoral appointment with priests, retreats, and much more. I'm deeply grateful for the work of the St. Raymond Nonatus Foundation. In a short time, it has already strengthened and sustained hundreds of families. For more information about this pastoral ministry, please visit the website on your screen and join me in praying for families throughout a local church. May God bless you abundantly. Hello, and welcome to a podcast from the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. This is Ann DeSantis, and this is our Families in Crisis podcast, where our topic this, this evening is St. Kateri Tekawitha. I want to introduce you to, as you already know, men, many of you already know, our board president, Mickey Kelly. Mickey, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Ann. Great to be here again. And I have to say that once more, we do have a very exciting saint to talk about. Uh, the only Native American saint to date in the Catholic Church, believe it or not, for all of us here. And I'm really excited that we unpack this one, who was just, who was canonized by Pope Benedict, the late Pope Benedict XVI, uh, a little over a decade ago. Um, I know there's some can is cause for canonization to work for other native american saints but i mean it's you know the saying goes it's good to be first like the state of delaware so you know something <laughs> to uh, discuss so yes and i think uh this has been a great series and for those of you who have been tuning in uh this is our as i said families in crisis podcast and we say families in crisis we're not just talking about like the whole family it really is for anybody individuals or families and um, this is our 10 Saints series. So if you haven't watched the other uh, episodes, be sure to go to our Filling Onatus YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch it. Now, this is part two. We did a whole series of part one. So this is a whole nother set, a whole other set of part two. Now, her feast day is July 14th. As Mickey said, she's the only Native American saint. She's the patron of environment and ecology. And by the way, I'm getting this from catholic.org, some of the information that I'm sharing with you. She was canonized on October 21st of 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI. She was beatified by Pope John Paul II. Now, she, she suffered a great deal. And when I'm looking at her bio, um, one of the things that it says on her bio is that she had contracted smallpox as a four-year-old child, which scarred her skin. The scars were a source of humiliation her, in her youth. She was commonly seen wearing a blanket to hide her face. Worse, her entire family died during the outbreak. Kateri Tekawitha was subsequently raised by her uncle, who was the chief of a Mohawk clan. Um, what else do you know about her, Mickey? I mean, I know there's a lot more to the story in terms of what she went through being a part of that Mohawk clan. Um, she only died when she was 24 years old. Um, I think she's a great saint for families in crisis. What do you think about that? Yes. And uh, Katara Tekawitha. So for those of us who are curious, what does Tekawitha mean, which is, Mo which is from Mohawk and Mohawk actually, for those that are, like to know since i'm offering um, a teeny bit of like um historical background so the mohawk nation were commonly around upstate new york and uh so like say like upstate new york like albany area which also the iroquois was around there 
in and also the Mohican tribe, which was a subject of a of a of a classic novel written by James Fenimore Cooper, The Last of the Mohicans, which also would turn into a movie that did get some uh, critically acclaimed awards for for like you know the Oscars and what have you. But anyway, what happened was when uh, a was a young girl, she actually contracted smallpox, as you mentioned, Ed. While she survived the disease, she had poor eyesight and she had scars in her face and eyes that, like you said, she actually had to cover her face, you know, quite literally. So she was like kind of like, you know, cloaking herself from, you know, from her ailments. And what happened was, uh, as a matter of fact, where does Tekawitha come from? So it actually is Mohawk for she bumps into things. The reason being was that her poor eyesight made her. I guess you could probably say like legally blind in like, you know, today's terms. So she was always bumping into things. Um, and there wasn't a lot of Christian faith um, you know, at the time that she was until the Jesuits really came into the picture, which actually brought her into, you know, the Catholic faith back when the Jesuits were really, you know, gung ho about the Catholic church. Unfortunately, not many of them are today, but we, we pray for their, you know, their conversion. And around her early 20s, in fact, um, St. Katara Tekawitha actually was received in the Catholic Church, in, in, in fact, on Christmas Day of 1677. And she actually uh, would actually be welcomed into the Montreal, Canada to join a, a, a community of Native American uh, converts to the faith. And she actually attributed her name from St. Catherine of Siena at the time of her baptism, which is very fitting too, because St. Catherine of Siena was very on fire with her faith and Katara Tekawitha was no except was no exception at all. Well said because you know there's so much information. You know, whenever we have these podcasts and we talk about the bios of some of these saints, you know, there's a, a lot of um, information to share. And, you know, Mickey was, was talking about some of that background information. Um, now, another thing that I was reading here is that she was a skilled worker too, diligent and patient, but she refused to marry. When her adoptive parents proposed a suitor to her, she refused to entertain the proposal. They punished her by giving her more work to do, but she did not give in. Instead, she remained quiet and diligent Eventually, they were forced to relent and accept that she had no interest in marriage. So she was really like dedicated to her faith and to chastity. Um, she didn't have any really uh, desire to get married or anything like that um, because she had a really um, deep, de you know, deep relationship with the Lord in prayer. Um, she was very devout. Um, it also says on this bio here that she was very sickly. Her practices of self-mortification and denial may not, not have helped her health. Sadly, just five years after her conversion to Catholicism, she became ill and passed away at age 24 in, at, on April 17th, 1680. Uh, now, I know there's quite a few saints that died at 24, right? I mean, St. Therese of Lisieux was 24. I know that Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati was 24. I think St. Gemma might have been around that same age, too. Um, so, yeah, somewhere around there. So um, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. I mean, for people who are watching this podcast and maybe that you're going through some kind of a crisis, whatever that is, I think St. Kateri is a good saint for families in crisis because she understood what adversity was in terms of family, right? She didn't really have family. So uh, talk about that, Mickey. I mean, don't you think um, she is a good role model? I mean, Certainly in today's day and age, we can't even picture some of the sufferings that she went through, right? I mean, when we say suffer, I mean, she really suffered a lot. Yes, and I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, determination and, you know, like you said, I mean, St. Kateri Tikawitha was diligent. She bore a lot of crosses, not just physical crosses, but also a social cross, you know, especially, you know, coming from her family. And I think what's so beautiful is that her dying words 
Lord Jesus, I love you. And then this, the funny, the, the, the miraculous part was that upon her death, the scars on her body began to heal. And it gave away to a radiant appearance on her face, which, you know, it's a, it's nothing, it, it's a miracle. You know, God would like use her death, like, you know, to heal her. And she was practically like in perfect condition. And many are wondered, well, is there a way like you can visit her shrine? The answer is yes. Um, in upstate around, um, around Albany area, I believe there is a shrine to her. As a matter of fact, there's also a shrine dedicated to, um, to the North American martyrs, like St. Isaac Job, um, um, Jean Le uh, Brebeuf, uh, pardon my French. Um, she's also has a shrine there. And there's also another one being constructed um, in around New Mexico area, I believe around Santa Fe or Albuquerque. It's something for you guys to consider on a pilgrimage once it's completed. And I think it's something that'll be like, you know, great for people to to visit, of course. You know, the visit and there's there's always some power in visiting shrines you know, of a particular saint, you know, here in Philadelphia, we have, you know, we have St. John New, New Norman Shrine, which is in the Northern Liberties area of Philadelphia, um, in the basement of St. Peter's Church. We have St. Catherine's Shrine, St. Catherine's Shrine, St. Catherine Drexel Shrine, which is at the Basilica of St. Peter and Paul Cathedral, because that's where her funeral was held. Uh, for St. Kateri Tekawitha uh, Shrine that's actually in Fonda, New York, which is, of course, upstate New York. And there's another shrine being constructed, like I said, in New Mexico. So that's something, you know, very exciting to see, too. And I highly recommend to visit the shrines of the saints, especially here in the United States. And, of course, you know, we go on pilgrimages like the U.S. border. Go for it. You know, it will change your life. And it brings something to the, it actually helps you. You know, it's like something, it's like one thing you learn about the saints, but every so often you need to like venerate the relic of a say. And most of the time it's like the body parts of the saints. You'd be surprised too. In fact, there's a relic out now of the, and I think we're going to be covered in very soon. But the family from Poland that harbored Jewish refugees that were escaping the grip, the, the, the grip of the Nazi regime that was so radical they wanted to wipe out the Jewish, you know, to fit Hitler's agenda. And there's a relic of the family, I believe the mother, who was killed along with her unborn child, which would have been child number seven by the Nazis. That's something very, that's like, you know, something to, to consider. It's going to tour the, the country, but I know it's in D.C. now. But to go back on topic, Secretary Tikawita, I mean, re remarkable young person. And like you said, Anne, she was young when she died. Like, she was like in her early, mid-20s. Like, Pierre Fassati, St. Therese, uh, St. Gemma. You know, they all died young. Just because a, they suffer greatly, or B, they suffer because they refuse to renounce their faith. And there's no question that they receive a hero's welcome, welcome in heaven because of their steadfast courage. Amen. Well said. I'm glad we addressed that because, you know, we also had the podcast about Pierre Giorgio Forsati. And um, so I encourage people to watch, you know, to watch that one too, um, you know, and, and there's always something we can learn from people who gave their lot or devoted their lives to prayer and that they either were martyred or they died at a young age, but that they were saints, right? I mean, that they were so devoted to God in everything. So um, I think that Kitiri Tikawitha is a wonderful saint for all of us but especially those younger people who may be going through some kind of a 
uh, family crisis. You can intercede. Now, there's a website too, I have to say. It's it's katirishrine.org. And Mickey mentioned the shrine up in um, uh, northern New York. It says here on the website too that due to her unique cultural position, Carrie, uh, Katiri has been a figure of debate. There are conflicting accounts of how much hardship she faced within her community due to her conversion with later authors ex explore, expo excuse me, extra exploding that from the, Je the, the, the Jesuit records. Mohawk oral history describes much less contemporary persecution than the Catholic biogra biographies written after her death and a greater respect for the skills she developed within the community. But some traditional Mohawks still take issue with her baptism into Catholicism or with the way Mohawk culture is represented through the lens of her conversion. So that's good to know that they're, um, just like with any saint, there's going to be some debates, I think. Don't you think, Mickey, that sometimes they debate uh, the lives of a saint? You know, how authentic, how much were they really devoted to Christ? How much suffering did they really undergo? So I think knowing that, you know, there are still people out there that probably are still uh, maybe debating her life. Um, but we can learn a lot, but just by reading uh, as much as we can about her. But can you imagine what it had been like for a young person like her with the disfigurement on her face and her eyes, how hard that would have been just on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, no, like I said at the beginning, she's also the patron saint of the environment and ecology. You know, um, a lot of younger people are concerned with those things. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I... I I would have to think to myself, what aspects of the environment or ecology was she herself concerned with? Or was it that she really lived out there, right? I mean, she lived out in the environment. She wasn't protected like some people, you know, uh, with a house and a roof over your head and, and food to eat that, that came just so easily, right? So I didn't know if you had any words to say on that. Well, and I think you brought up a good point too. Like she's also the pa like she's a patron saint of ecology and like environmental stuff. Um, ecologist you know, falls in there. Um, she also was also um, people who are ridiculed for their piety, and she's a patron saint of those people. People who are in ex exile. So to understand the culture, Native Americans. Not many of them were very well were very welcome of Christianity, let alone the fact that Jesuits were living among them. And there was actually a Jesuit that did write a Christmas carol, you know, for the like in Huron, which of course was the common language around upstate New York. And you know, try to evangelize them what Christmas is all about, you know, through their missionary efforts. But for St. Catar take a week though. What happened was when the family came to know that it wasn't just her that converted, but also her uncle's daughter that also converted, um, or Kateri's sister, something around those lines, they also converted too. And they were actually in exile for so many years. Now, to, to discuss the part about the, 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 the uh, ecology, I think something that like people are like wonder like what is so special about her being in egg well like you know with ecology. Well, let's face it, she did live off the land, so to speak. And part of it's because like the village, you know, barred her, you know, from taking part in Native American like traditions and what have you, because she embraced Christianity. And you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, accepting God, accepting Christ does come with a price. But she accepted with so much grace that what a saint to look up to, you know, and this is not a pun or anything, but she did not need a reservation to become a saint at all. You know, God called her, she followed it, and in those five years of being Catholic, 
this is where she is. And now here we are with the first Native American saint. And I, I can guarantee you one thing, Anne, she won't be the last. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. Well said. And I was just thinking, Mickey, um, I think she would also be a good saint for those who are persecuted for their Catholic faith. Right. So, I mean, if you're someone who maybe you just converted or maybe uh, you're in a situation at work or school or your neighborhood or your family where you're being you feel you're being persecuted for your faith. I think that she'd be the perfect saint for you to intercede to. Now, she had smallpox, right? Now, smallpox back then, not many people survived smallpox, right? Um, and I think of some uh, other diseases and pandemics and things that have happened over the years, right? I would certainly think that she'd be a good patron saint for epidemics and pandemics. Would you agree on that? I think that people who are suffering with physical ailments can intercede to St. Kateri Tekawitha. So uh, now this is just a short podcast. We just want to educate you on these wonderful saints of your faith, of our Catholic faith, um, with our 10 Saints podcast series. Now you might be watching this podcast and you might be thinking, I'm interested in learning about some of the other services at the foundation. All you need to do is go to our website at nonatis.org. You can send us a confidential prayer request or you can make a free appointment with a Mercedarian priest for either spiritual direction or just to talk to a priest about some other issue. So be sure to reach out to us at nonatis.org and make that appointment because we want to, not only do we want to educate you through something like this podcast, but we also want to help you too. And we're happy to do that. So Mickey, did you have any final words on St. Kateri Tekawitha before we end? Um, I would say the final words I could say is that, you know, St. Kateri Tekawitha is someone, is the also known as the Lily of the Mohawks. And she understood the presence of God, especially in nature which also explains why she is the patron saint in the environment. And God is definitely present in nature. We just need to, uh, like, you know, realize that. And she had a deep devotion to nature and its beauty after her conversion. And she also wanted people to blend the faith in Christ with respect for their surroundings. And I think for us, we too can do this by you know making sure that you know of course the trash is cleaned up we're not doing things that could inflict harm on you know trees or what have you of course you know give it water and all that but you know just making sure like you know if there's like trash around just clean it up you know things like that recycle you know things like that but also too like not polluting you know what god has created you know i think that's very important you do those things. I mean, of course, you know, you know, also take time to go out into nature and experience the presence of God that it surrounds you. And honestly, you know what? The nature of God is the best medicine anyone could ask for. It's not pharmaceuticals. You know, it's God and nature. Those two things can really help alleviate, inoculate you from some of the problems you are experiencing. Right. I, I like everything that you said, and especially the part about appreciating nature. You know, there's something that helps to draw us to God when we can notice uh, the trees, the flowers, the sky, the beauty in the landscape, uh, the beauty of the ocean, the beauty of mountains, right? There's so much uh, beauty all around us, and we can intercede to saint, a saint like St. Kateri Tekawitha when we want to draw closer to God in our environment too. Mickey, thanks so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to our next episode. Right. We will see all of you here next month for our Families in Crisis series. This is our 10 Saints Part 2. See you then.